This is the song, this is the day. Would you come up and help me lead this song? We're going to be singing, This is the day. Come on up and help me lead this song. I need some help. Come on, kids. Big kids, too. Come on, come on. Nobody wants to come up. We don't want the baptistry to get cold. Hurry up. <laughs> Nobody wants to do it, do they? Come on, come on. It'll be fun. Yes. Anybody else want to help us lead? Riker and Cameron. Riker and Cameron. No? Okay, here we go. Christ told us to go and make disciples and to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And what a wonderful thing it is. It's a great day when the pastor gets to put his swim trucks on and his flip-flops at the beginning of service. So, And I had a few people tell me that they wanted to do that. And I said, you're more than welcome to come. So we'd love to have you. But anyway, Maverick has come to us today and he has accepted the Lord as his Lord and Savior and uh, wants to be baptized. So we're presenting Maverick to you. He's already presented to the congregation. So Maverick, have you uh, repented of all your sins? Yes. And accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Well, upon your profession of faith, we're going to baptize you. Let's turn you around here. And in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I baptize you in the name of... Glory all be to God. Amen. I don't know me personally. I wouldn't care if the preacher preached about this loud. I would not. 
I wouldn't be mad if the preacher preached in flip flops and shorts every day. I don't look. I mean, so. Okay, so you're stuck with me for announcements this morning. <laughs> really? That kind of hurt my feelings. That, that, that hurt my feelings. Okay, out of the mouth of babes. So we have a Bring Your Bible to School Day. I think this is a very important one. Um, October 5th, Bring Your Bible to School. We have a nice little uh, insert in here. Um, so if you have any questions on that, look at that paper. Join us for the Women's Retreat. Christy, would you like to do a plug-in for this one? Oh, you know I would. I so, um, November the 4th, ladies, living in our seasons, the season that God has put you in right now, it's that you are living in it, I had actually seen a calendar appointment uh, that said butter my biscuits and I had to ask the question of like what was that and I guess you guys were going to do a workshop at one time how to make biscuits we were, but we ended up doing the retreat okay <laughs> I was like um, okay I, I did not know what this was okay if you have any if you have a need or special prayer request or you're our first time visitor tear off this little sheet and fill it out and put it in the offering plate we're not selling you anything but Jesus and we would like to, to hear from you our Ray Roberts Home Missions Offering supports all missions in the state of Ohio. We are currently out of at $600 of our 1,000 uh, goal, so we see the graph up here. If you'd like to give to that in the offering plate, just put Ray Roberts on your offering form. Uh, the pastor who would like to thank those who showed up to yesterday's leadership meeting. Also, thank you to those who donated for coats for TCN. They were very appreciative, made the pastor feel warm inside, not just warm outside, to help uh, keep for helping to keep some kids warm this winter. Jesus is awesome. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, the pastor and Lisa will be out of town October 19th, or October 9th, and the pastor will be back to church October 23rd. Please contact any of the deacons if you have any needs during this time. Join us this evening at 445 for discipleship training as we start the new unit, Old Testament Faith. Tonight's topic is Noah, finding favor with God. See Jim Dempsey for any questions. Jim, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, it's going to be a good study on that. We're going to learn a lot about it. The final ladies' Bible study will be held this Tuesday at the church instead of Martha's house at 6:30. Any questions? See uh, Christy or Martha. Uh, Thursday, October 5th is National Bring Your Bible to School Day. We've already, got, we've already covered that one. I do have a video to show. I, we'll see if we can get it snuck in. Um, There'll be a quarterly meeting of the finance committee next Sunday after the morning services. See Jerry or Debbie, which they're both outside right now, if you have any questions. Grief Share has seven more Thursdays from 6 to 7.30 p.m. If you have any questions, see Jim or Christy. The class is open to everyone, not just church members. So if you know anyone struggling, please let them know about the class. All materials are paid for by the church. There will be a Flamingos meeting at 10 a.m. Saturday, October 21st. Do you have anything to add about that one? Do you want to do a caca? Okay, ladies, ready? Three, two, one. Caca! Okay, so here's the big one. The Harvest Festival is just a few weeks away. It will be October 31st from 6 to 7.30 p.m. We are still needing bags of candy, boxes of Little Debbies, and full-size candy to give out as winning prizes. There will be tubs in the foyer for your donations. Please give full-size candy to Christy. This event is an alternative to trick-or-treating. Our theme will be fall with fall decorations and no witches, skeletons, monsters, etc., etc. If you would like to donate money towards the festival rather than shop, 
Please see Lauren or Christy or place your donation in the tithing envelope, Mart Harvest Festival. Thank you in advance. And then that's pretty much it. Now I get my normal speech up here. Men, in one week from tomorrow, October 4th, no, two weeks, October 14th, we will have our next men's study. It's 1 Samuel 8 will be in. What an amazing study. And you know, I get up here to encourage you guys. I'm not perfect. I'm far from perfect. I'm probably one of the most flawed people in this church. I get so much out of the studies we did. This morning's Bible study, um, Sunday school, was, I don't know, an eye-opener. We are so prideful in not asking for help. We don't go to the Lord for help. We don't go to our church family for help. We need to remove that pride from ourselves. I've, I struggled all week. I have struggled all week, and I never asked for help. Shame on me. I have a loving church family here that I can call any one of you guys, and you guys would pray for me. Shame on me. So we are one big community here, and not just isolated to our church, but there's other believers throughout our community that we know. Man, it's important. We have other men from other churches that come, and we're fellowshipping with other men from other churches. So it's great to know people outside of our little, you know, close-knit community, but it's nothing, this is God's word. It speaks to you. We learned about how Samuel was a great disciple last week, and really, we didn't come to this conclusion until the end of our study. It was like, okay, what happened? Well, it just showed us a perfect example of Samuel being a great disciple, which we are called to be great disciples. So I just encourage you, find a Bible study, find a daily windows. If you need something, reach out to us. Like I said, I, was, I had a horrible week, and I never reached out for any prayer. I went to the hospital last week, and I never told anybody that I went to the hospital. Shame on me. I should have said, hey, brothers, pray for me, or hey, sisters, pray for me. I'm struggling with something. It's that pride. All of us are not perfect, but we have a family that stands behind us. So I just encourage you, find some way to get in God's word this week. Find some way to plug in and have some fellowship with our, with our body here, and uh, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, as we go into our time of worship, Lord, we just ask that you remove any and all distractions from our service, Lord. We just ask that you place your hand upon T Brother Tucker, and we just ask that you hide him behind that cross and only give him the words to speak to us. Lord, uh, we just thank you for his time and devotion in your word this week. And Lord, as those distractions are removed, Lord, we just ask that you allow the message to penetrate our hearts, Lord. Allow us to bold boldly go into this world and proclaim that you are the true risen Lord and Savior. Lord, we love you. We thank you for sending your son to die for our sins when we do not deserve it one bit. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> I really appreciate Donnie's encouragement to pray for each other. Song leader, songs come to mind. The What a Friend We Have in Jesus song just came to mind as he was encouraging us to seek prayer from others. It says, Oh, what needs we often forfeit. Oh, oh what needless pain we bear. Because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And I wish we could sing that now, but we have planned to sing when we all get to heaven. Number 514, when we all get to heaven. And that'll be a great day too. Our ushers will come forward uh, with our morning offering after that. When we all get to heaven, 514. Sing the wondrous joy of Jesus.
rushing out of me.
<clears throat> I've been to a lot of funerals here the last couple months. A lot of it's been family and close friends. And every time I sing this song, that's where I want to be. <laughs> so it, this was laid on my heart this morning to sing it. I'm kind of homesick. Lord, we ask that you do be with the teachers that are down there. Just watch over them and help them with the message. Just help those kids to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would, turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I'm going to pick you up where we left off. We'll be in start at verse 9. Actually, our text verses for today will be 14 through 16. But what a beautiful day we've already had here at the Lewisburg Baptist Church. Anytime a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ comes and takes that next step of obedience in the Lord, it's a wonderful day here at the church. And we just love that and we thank you for your witness, Maverick. And it's a wonderful day that we've had. We've been talking about the church. 
Who's in? Who's not? Are you a born-again believer? Do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Do you know that He died for your sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day? And do you believe that with all your heart, with all your might, and with all your strength? And love the Lord your God with all your might, with all your strength, and all your hope. And then we looked at once we did that, and once we were baptized, and once we have become believers, that we are members of God's church. And then what it was and what it looked like to be a disciple. So we've been looking at all those things. And then last week we started a little series, of, if you will, called The Church. It's the gospel made visible. What we as a corporate group are supposed to be showing the world outside of these four walls. Throughout the Bible, we find the use of the image of light and darkness. God and the things of God are called light, while the ways of the world and those, things that are, those that are separated from God are called darkness. As those who are in a relationship with God through Christ, not only are we identified as light, for it says in Ephesians 5, 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. We are called to shine as a light so the world can see the work of God and we can give Him glory out there in that world. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, and this is Jesus talking, You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. As a church, that's what we are supposed to be doing. We are supposed to be giving light out there into the world. As Jesus said, it's pretty obvious. You don't turn on a light in the house and and say, okay, this is my little light. My little light's going to shine, but you can't sit in my light. That light shines out to everybody, and that's how we ought to be as Christians. Our light should shine so that it hits everybody that we're around. Last week we started considering a section of commands in Romans chapter 12, and we had this in mind, that God intends to use His church, those born-again believers, and our presence in this world as a means of revealing God's character and the power of the gospel all to His glory. Of course, we must speak the gospel. We must tell people that Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and He rose again the third day, and He's coming again to judge the living and the dead. But as believers, we are also have an opportunity to live in such a way, ladies and gentlemen, that it makes the power of the gospel visible to the people that are out there in the world. Oftentimes it's said that people are actually watching you live the gospel more than they're hearing you preach the gospel. They're looking at your lives, trust me. And if your life doesn't match up to what they they feel like it should as a Christian, trust me, they're going to nail you for it. And you know it. The first thing they're going to say is, oh, look at those people, they're hypocrites. That's why it's so important that we shine as a light. And it's so important that we make sure that we know our scriptures and the word of God so that we know that we are following the ways of God and nothing else. That world is watching Romans 11, or 1 through 11, it gives a full explanation of the gospel. It tells us about our sin condition. It tells us about how salvation was accomplished by the death of Jesus and how that salvation is applied to me and you. And now in chapter 12, Paul begins to explain to us in very practical ways, in very practical ways, those that who have been changed by the gospel, how we should live. Paul in verses 9 through 21, he gives us a long list of commands and it has a definite progression. The first focus is on relationships in the church, how we were to interact with one another in here. Of course, these will apply that we're talking to today also to those that are in the church. But now we're going to move out a little bit of our relationships, of what's happening with us outside of the church in verses 14 through 16 particularly those who are opposed to us, our opponents. Some of them are our enemies. We need to keep in mind that first and the primary command in verse 9 that we read last week and we talked about quite extensively. In verse 9 it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Of course, true love can't be have hypocrisy, can it? It wouldn't be true love. Not at all. 
But our love needs to be genuine, and it needs to make, and the rest of these commands will flow from that genuine love. I'm going to tell you right here and now what we're talking about today. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you don't have the agape love to be able to live these commandments out. It's just not going to happen. You're going to live in your flesh, and you're going to continue. And these are going to be a real good barometer for us as to how our situation is in the Lord, and where we are in our faith life. Verses 14 through 16, of course... It comes to our responses to those who are around us that we live with in a daily basis. Of course, these responses are very different from the ways that we naturally respond to people. We serve as a witness to the Lord by how we live our life out there in the world that we have changed, that we don't live like the natural man, and that's what we're going to see today in these verses. So if you're able, please stand with me for the reading of God's Word if you're able. We're going to put in at verse 9, read through 21, but our text verses today are verses 14, 15, and 16. The word of the Lord. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let us pray. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, and we do thank you for your word. Lord, we just hope and pray throughout this service that each and everything done that's heard and spoken, Lord, would be pleasing to you. We just ask that your will be done. Lord, we thank you for the working of your Holy Spirit, for we know that where two or three are gathered together, you are amongst us, Lord. Just help that convicting power. If there's anyone out there that doesn't know Christ as their Lord and Savior, we hope today is the day of salvation for them. Just let them have that conviction, convict their heart, and that they would want to come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We thank you so much for your word, and you tell us how we are to live our lives out in the world, Lord. Just help us to take it to heart, help us to apply the message to it, and to actually learn it, and then to, to do it out in the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, the first thing that we're going to look at is in verse 14. It says, we must, be a, we must be a people who respond to persecution with blessing and not cursing. Verse 14 said, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. There's what to do and what not to do here. The first thing is what to do is we're to bless. And what not to do, we're not to curse. First of all, let's look at what persecution is. Persecution, by definition, the persecution, of course, out of this world word that goes back into the Greek, is in any way, whatever, to harass, to trouble, or to molest. And that word molest there means to, to pester in an aggressive or a persistent manner. What it is, is it's continually to give someone a hard time in a constant and a very aggressive way. This happens quite often in our country right now, as most of us know. There's many ways that it manifests itself. It manifests itself racially, where we have those racial divides and people persecute one another because of that. Sometimes it's cultural, where there's different cultures, and we certainly have a mixing of our cultures in our country, don't we? And oftentimes those things clash. It also, of course, happens politically. They couldn't get stuff right up there if they wanted to, could they? I mean, you could tell them black is white and white is black, and they'd somehow find a way to disagree about that. 
And then there's also religiously. We look at how long the Jews themselves have been persecuted, God's chosen people. And of course, we as Christians often find ourselves being persecuted. Here with COVID, we got a little bit more of that in this country than we had had before. And thank God there were some very godly men who spoke out against that. But as I was thinking about that this this week, you know, I had to kind of wonder, and sometimes I do wonder, if you and I are being salty enough and giving off enough light. The reason that I ask that question is, is because really if you think about it, persecution toward Christians, while it may be increasing, it most certainly is not great. I do not feel a constant pressure of persecution in my Christian faith right now. So sometimes I have to wonder, are we being salty enough and are we shining enough light? Because I think if we were being really, really salty and we were given the kind of light in truth that we were to be given, I think that persecution might just be a little bit stronger. And the reason that I tend to believe that is because Scripture confirms for believers that there will be persecution. I often wonder what the church would actually look like here in America if the persecution really started. I mean, how many of us would be in here every Sunday if it really did start? And it was the norm rather than the exception for each and every one of us. I hope and pray that our faith is strong and such that we would be here every Sunday. Because Scripture does tell us there's a surety of persecution. While you and I live in a time and a place where we are often shielded from opposition, and I know I haven't felt a whole lot lately, Although maybe some's getting ready to come up with LifeWise, I got a feeling somehow, some way, uh, us trying to get into the school with God's word is going to make a difference. Maybe we'll start feeling a little more of that. Matter of fact, I kind of hope the heat gets turned up a little bit. Scriptures are very, very clear that the norm, ladies and gentlemen, for believers is persecution. Just as Jesus Christ was hated, we are ex- we should expect to be hated ourselves. John 15, 20 says, Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the religious leaders in Jesus' time wanted him dead. They wanted him gone. They hated him with a passion. Matter of fact, probably in those days, if they'd had most wanted posters, his face would have been on them and sitting in the temple. That Jewish leadership, they denied him and they accused him from the day he started his ministry until the day they hung him on a cross. And 2 Timothy 3.12 tells us, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It says there will. It doesn't say maybe. We need to thank God that we're in the place that we're at in the world where we're at. We need to make sure that our faith is strong if that persecution does come because we've really been able to sit back in our lazy boys because we really haven't had the devil come at us. And in some respects, ladies and gentlemen, we've allowed things to happen in our country and allowed them to take it away. That's probably why the fire hasn't been turned up. And I think we're starting to see some of what happens when the fire does get turned up. The abortion issue, you look at it, Man, once that got going, look at the, how fired up they are at us and the Christians and those that believe that, the, that at conception it's life. So ladies and gentlemen, if we are living godly lives, the enemy action will be persecution toward us. And it can take many, many forms. You can be ostracized. You can be made fun of. You can be shunned by your loved ones. You can be made an outlier. You can be thought of as a fool for believing that kind of stuff. I actually had somebody one time ask me, do you really believe that stuff? I'm like, yeah, I sure do. It's the truth. And then, of course, to the utmost extremes, it can be physical. You can even lose your life. And there's people all over the world that are losing their lives and in fear of their lives right now today because they're holding services on a Sunday. 
I know of a couple that's in Morocco right now, and right now there's an underground church, and there's only about four or five people that they know of that are Christians. And if they find out that they're Christians and trying to spread the gospel, they most certainly will be dead tomorrow. That's persecution. And praise the Lord that there are people that are willing to go into those places. Amen? Amen. This verse tells us both the correct response, as I said, and the wrong response to persecution. The correct is for us to bless. The wrong is for us to curse. Let's look at the blessing first. It tells us here to bless our persecutors. Not an easy thing to do for most of us, especially if we're in our natural man and not in the Spirit. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But in this context... When Paul's telling us in this letter to Romans that we are to bless, what it means for us is to bless someone is to ask God to show them favor. Somebody that's giving you a hard time and harassing you, Paul's saying you need to ask God to give them good favor just like you received. Amen? Amen. We should desire for, God to see, for them to see God and to be changed by Him just as you and I have been once we heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 43 and 44 says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. There's one way, ladies and gentlemen, that we can turn that persecution around. Somebody that's after us. We can get down on our knees because you and I, ladies and gentlemen, aren't going to change anybody's heart. Nobody out here changed my heart. Nobody out there, any born-again believers that are out there, changed your heart other than the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus Christ changes your heart. And what we need to do is to preach that gospel. And like I said, the heat's going to get turned up the more we get salty and the more we get light. But that's what they need to hear because until and unless they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they're going to continue to persecute the world Amen. because they don't know and they don't understand the truth. You see, we need to be praying that they become born again, ladies and gentlemen. We need to pray that God's grace and mercy that was rained down upon us rains down upon them. Otherwise, they're going to continue to be in darkness and they're going to continue to persecute the church. <clears throat> Obviously, I think each and every one of us know right now that if we had every person in this whole wide world would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, this world would be a better place, wouldn't it? And then we would not have to worry about this persecution. You see, we need to ask God to have mercy on them. We need to ask God to convict them of the truth. We need to ask God to pour that convicting power of the Holy Spirit out upon them so that their stony heart, the ground, might be broken up and they might come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And we all know stories where it has been done, don't we? Amen? The next thing it tells us in that verse is, Bless, don't curse. You guys remember verse 9 from last week? Let me read it to you. Love without hypocrisy. Well, here's your test, ladies and gentlemen, of unhypocritical, I can't get it out, unhypocritical love. You see, this right here might be a real good banner to know if you are loving the Lord and you are growing in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you and I's natural desire when someone comes at us, isn't it? The natural man, what do we want to do? We want God to punish him, don't we? We want God to maybe do harm to our enemies. We ask God, sometimes we'd like to ask Him to curse them. We want to see them hurt like we've been hurt, don't we? When you're a natural man and you're not in the Spirit. Those that hurt us, we want them to hurt back. That's the way the world works. That's how they come after us. You see, and when we bless and we don't curse and they see that, they see something totally different than what they're used to because that's what they're used to seeing and that's what they're used to doing. If I get hurt, I'm going to hurt back. You don't believe that? I'll bring you two three-year-olds up here. And if one of them wants a toy 
and the other one has it, and one of them grabs it, and one of them gets hurt, the other one's coming after them, aren't they, to hurt them back. And that just proves our sin nature, and it's born in us, isn't it? They don't have to learn that, and the world hasn't learned that. They just know it by nature. It's supernatural, ladies and gentlemen, to do the opposite of that. And the world sees it. And we should be an example. You see, the call of this command is to ask God to show mercy and to grant grace rather than His wrath. You know, right now in our, in our nation, I mean, a lot of us would just love to see the hand of God come down on what's happening in our nation, wouldn't we? But well, we better be careful what we ask for, because if that wrath does come down, we, we could be hurting too, unless Jesus Christ raptures us out. But just for that very reason, not too long ago, and it's out there on the table if you want it more, we put a prayer guide out, prayer guide how to pray for our leaders, especially those who don't know Jesus Christ, what we should be praying for them for, so that they do quit pers- persecuting the Christians and they do quit doing things against God's will. Amen? You see, you and I have Jesus as our example, and that's the example we're supposed to use. In Luke 23, 34, this is when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, the most excruciating way that a man could ever die. And He went to the cross willingly for me and for you. And this is what He said on the cross about those, us, who hung Him on the cross because of our sin. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, ladies and gentlemen, when we are out there in that world and we are out there in that darkness, we need to remember that we have come out of darkness and we are now in the light. Oftentimes we forget that we were in that darkness. And we do need to remember that we are out there. We need to remember, ladies and gentlemen, that those people out there, many of them are ignorant of the ways of God. And they do not have the Holy Spirit within them. They don't have the capability to do different than you do. Or like you do, I should say, if you're a Christian. And you don't revile. It amazes me how many kids, how many actually people under the age of 40 don't know much about God. Don't know who He is. Don't know His character. Don't know what a good God He is. If you want, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Because Peter tells us how we are to deal with those out in the world that are our masters and those that are that are persecuting us. 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll put it in at verse 18. We'll read through the end of the chapter. It says here, servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. The world's pretty harsh to us sometimes, isn't it? For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and you suffer and you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in His mouth, who when He was reviled did not revile in return. When He suffered, He did not threaten, but committed Himself to Him who judges righteously, who Himself bore our sins in His own body on a tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We need to do exactly as our Lord and our Savior did. We too need to make sure that we turn the other cheek. It's not an easy thing to do unless you're in the Spirit. If you need to remember how to be in the Spirit, go to Galatians 5 today and do a little bit of your homework. But at any rate, ladies and gentlemen, you as born-again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I need to come to a place where we are in the same, our faith is just as strong as Stephen was. 
you remember in Acts chapter 7, Stephen was given the gospel and he was giving it to the Jews. He was telling them all about it in the synagogue that day. And if you remember, Saul was sitting there. He was there. Paul was act, or Saul was acting as the uh, coat check when Stephen got stoned outside of the temple. And in Acts 7, 59 through 60, I wonder just how many of us, if we were given the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're persecuting us, they're running us out of the temple, and they're throwing stones at us, if we would be able to say this. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not char charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. It's not an easy thing to say when someone's after you and wants you dead, is it? The next thing that we see is we must be a people who respond to those around us with a genuine empathy. That's in verse 15. Let's go back to our text and read that. Verse 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Well, the first thing is it says rejoice with those who rejoice. This may seem like a very easy command, ladies and gentlemen. It's easy to rejoice with people that we love, isn't it? And something good has happened to them. And we think compared to these other commands, man, I may have this one down. I can rejoice when people rejoice. But I want to tell you something. I believe it's harder to rejoice with those who rejoice than what you think. Because it's not just to rejoice with the ones that we're happy for. It's to rejoice with the ones that there's something we may be unhappy about. And that's a whole different story. And why do I say that? Well, because, ladies and gentlemen, we still have that old nature in us. And it often rears its ugly head. That old nature struggles with what? Struggles with envy. It struggles with jealousy. And most importantly, it struggles with pride, doesn't it? You see, when, we, when others receive the things that we desire, we must rely on the Spirit to help us enter into their joy going to ask you a couple of questions here. You ever been passed over for a promotion? You ever not gotten a job and you lost it to somebody that was less qualified than you? Have you ever not made the starting lineup? Has someone else gotten a raise and you didn't when you've been doing all the work? Maybe perhaps you're here in the church and you thought that there's a ministry that should, should have went to you and it didn't go to you, someone else got it. Now I want to ask you a question. If you had any of those things or something similar to those happening to you, did you rejoice with the people who got the job or who got the raise? That's what this command's telling us to do. It's telling us that we have to rejoice with those who may have gotten something that we wished that we had had tells us to rejoice with those who sometimes it's hard to rejoice over. That's that love without hypocrisy. That's that agape love, that self-sacrificing agape love, that love that loves because it wants to love, that love that's giving. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 through 27 says that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. I want to give you another reason to rejoice other than the fact that it's, I just told you that it's hard to rejoice. I want you to know something. I want you to hear this clear. Because if you didn't receive something and somebody else did, God has something better for you. And you need to make sure that you remember that. Don't let your heart be hurt and let your heart be troubled. He knows what you need. He knows when you need it. Maybe you didn't need that. Maybe it would, give, it would have given you more pride and envy that you needed. Maybe you needed that lesson. But you see, God is good all the time. He knows exactly what's best for you. So you can rest assured if you didn't get a promotion, you got passed over, you didn't make the starting lineup, God knows what you're going through. And you can rejoice in the fact that He's there working for you. 
And you can rejoice in the fact that He knows the beginning and the end of a matter. And it's all coming out to your good. Amen? Amen. You know, we need to just make sure that we commit everything, ladies and gentlemen, to His care and rejoice even when it doesn't feel like we should be rejoicing. I don't know how many times in my lifetime, ladies and gentlemen, that I've begged God for something and He hasn't given it to me. And almost every time that I've done that, I will most assuredly tell you that later on He's revealed to me why, and later on there's been a greater blessing than what I ever could have imagined. That's how good God is. The next it tells us to weep with those who weep. True empathy goes beyond just saying I'm sorry and saying I'm praying for you. This command calls for us to bear one another's burdens and to walk with each other in our griefs just as our Savior Jesus Christ did. You know, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is... He bore our sins. All of our grief, all of our sorrows have been taken away in the man in God, Jesus Christ. He died for us. I want to go over to John chapter 11, if you want to join me there. I want to show Jesus' empathy on display here. John chapter 11. We'll put in at verse 32. It's a story that's familiar to many of us. Lazarus has died. They're all weeping. Jesus had waited four days to go see Mary and Martha. And now we put in, when he gets there, when he gets to that tomb, to Mary and Martha's house, it says, Then when Mary came, came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. That's empathy, ladies and gentlemen. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. The shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of, the, of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that, you would, that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I say this, that they may believe that you have sent me, that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. A lot of commentators and a lot of people speculate why Jesus wept. I can't prove this, but I tell you what, I believe Jesus, He really had no reason to weep, did He? That we know of. He knew He was going to raise Lazarus, didn't He? Didn't He? He knew that Lazarus could be raised from the dead. Why would Jesus weep? Because Jesus was empathizing with us. He knew what had happened with sin and death. You see, our God created Adam and Eve and He put them in a garden and He put Him there in innocence. And in that innocence, He asked them to obey. Obey just one little bitty thing, didn't He? And of course, we all know the story. They didn't do that. That's the whole problem that we have with the world now is because they couldn't obey. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that's why Jesus was weeping because that's the model that God had for us. That we would be in innocence, ladies and gentlemen, and that we would be in obedience with Him. 
And that sin had turned everything upside down and black and had made us just something that he had to come and had to reconcile to himself. What a wonderful God we have. But he wept because he knew what it could have been. He wept and saw what it was. And greater yet, he went to a cross and died for you and me so that you and I would not have to weep no more. Because one day, he tells us there'll be no more sorrow and there'll be no more tears for all who are in him. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ, for all of us who are saved by grace through faith, he has loosed sin and death. Those grave clothes are gone. And you and I, we no longer have to weep. But I don't know about you, but I still do weep because I empathize for people out there who don't know Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. We all have loved ones who are probably not saved that we want to get there. You and I are called to empathize. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, it says, Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. You can't put on those qualities unless you take something off, ladies and gentlemen. And the only way you can take it off is to go to the cross. You have to take off that old nature. You have to repent of your sins and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and to have the Holy Spirit living in you. And then you can put off those old clothes and put on these new ones. You need to take off that envy, that pride, and that jealousy. The next thing we see in the first part of 16 is we must be a people who respond with a desire for unity. Let's go back to our text. 16 says, be of the same mind toward one another. There's a call here, ladies and gentlemen, for us to be of one mind and be one mind to one another. You and I, you know, really we should be up here and we should be in one great concert. We should all move as one big body, not individually. This is a call for us to be of one mind with one another. We are to strive for agreement in the truth and to be an example of God's unity out there in the world. You see, if they see us doing the same thing here in the church that's going on outside, they think, well, what's different about those people? And actually, really, what is different about us if we're not doing what the Lord tells us to do? You see, beloved, this is easier than it often, easier thing than it often is. What we really, really need to do is we need to focus exactly on what we're thinking about here, what we're talking about. It says here, be of the same mind toward one another. How do you and I get to be of the same mind? I'm going to tell you how. We all have the mind of Christ. And if we have that mind of Christ, Jesus Christ is God's family. We are in God's family and He is the head of that family. We have His Word, we have His example, and ladies and gentlemen, His Word is supreme. And we must follow it. If we are of this mindset, we will be of one mind. You see, oftentimes, ladies and gentlemen, we get too, too down in the weeds with our Bible. We really do. I always like, I said it before, I'll say it again, I love Alistair Begg. His, his saying is, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. And if we get right down to it, what did Jesus tell us to do? He said to preach the gospel. That's what we are to do as a church. We are to let people know that there is a hope. We are to let people know that there is a light. We need, are to let people know that there is eternal life. We are to let people know that there is an eternal soul. We are to let people know that there is a Savior. And that Savior died for them. And that's really our mindset as a church family. And that's really what we're to go out in the world to do is to let people know about Jesus and how awesome He really is. And if we really get focused down on that and not focus on the peripheries, could you imagine if we get all the churches just to have a mind of Christ? What we could do in this world. You see, we need to put away the desires of our flesh. We need to put away our religion. We need to put away our traditions of men. 
And what we need to do is become true disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of Him. If you're a true follower of Jesus Christ, a lot of what I'm talking about is going to come a whole lot easier. We need to be of one mind. We need to be doing the will of our Lord. And the commandment that He gave us, the commission that we have, is to go and make disciples and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. If we keep that primary mission in mind, we're doing well. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and of the same judgment. And that is the mind of Christ. And remember, if you've got aught with your brother or sister in Christ, you need to take it to them. And I'm going to tell you something. My God is a God of reconciliation. And we need to make sure that we know if we are, as, as a church body, if there's something that's hurting us, we need to remember that God wants us to reconcile. Philippians 1.27 says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. John 13, 35 says, By this you will know that you are my dis they will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Is your love without hypocrisy? Do you have that agape love for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Even the ones that aren't so lovable? God doesn't tell us we get to choose. God says we gotta love them. I always loved hearing Miss Becky say that. Gotta love them. Have a problem. She'd go around and she'd look. That's the first thing she'd say to you. Gotta love them. They might be a stinker, but you gotta love them. The last part of verse 16. We must be a people who respond with humility toward others. That's in the last part of 16. I'll read it. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Boy, the world ought to hear that one, shouldn't it? Those final three commands of verse 16 encourage us, all toward, uh, encourage us toward humility in our views and in our attitudes toward those that are around us. Now, I'm going to probably have to have Donnie block this out on the live stream. I don't normally give people a whole lot of kudos, but I, here I'm going to give my wife a little bit of kudos as far as humility. I'm teasing. <laughs> He, he was going out to, to do that. I don't want her to hear it. She might get the big head, and then he'd be in trouble. <laughs> but you all know high school. Most of us remember high school. Some of us, it's been a really long time, right? But it was a very clicky place, wasn't it? <laughs> One that's a little closer to it than what we are. But one of the things that drew me to my wife when I, when I met her was is it, it, it amazed me how she modeled this, and I didn't even know it at the time. A humility. She gets along. If you can't get along with my wife, you're in trouble. <laughs> Why do you think I married her? <laughs> she always did that, modeled that, and I love her for it. And I, I saw it in her very early in our relationship, it was like she got along with everybody. It didn't matter whether you had, you had a, a jean jacket on with a patch of weed on the back of your shirt or whether you were, you, know, you were the prom king. She could converse with anybody, and that's how we're supposed to be. And that's, I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, I thank God for my wife because I'm not sure I could model that quality like she does without having to be around it every day. I'm being real honest with you here because I can be a little stinker. <laughs> and trust me, in high school, I had my nose up here a little bit. <laughs> it's telling us do not be haughty is what he's saying. It's saying, or set your mind on high things. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I, we need to lower our noses. Hopefully, coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, you all know You've, come in, you've had to come in humility, so you've lowered your nose a little bit.
But you know what? Oftentimes what happens is, is we tend to get saved and our nose goes back up a little bit. We need to make sure we keep it down. I saw something this past week that really, really struck me when I, was, I happened to turn the television on. I think I was getting ready to watch the news, but they had the last of the People's Choice of Awards of the country music on. They were given an award, and I've heard this guy's music a little bit, given an award to a guy named Jelly Roll. <laughs> and Jelly Roll really looks like a Jelly Roll. He is a big man. I've heard a couple of his songs, and, and it, you know, it, he really, it, it says a lot about the world if you, if you hear his music. And what Jelly Roll, what struck me at first, I, I saw it and I didn't think much about it, but it kept coming back to me and it came back to me again late yesterday and last night. He had a vest on when he was out there singing his songs. One of, these, one of the songs that he has is called A Lost Cause. And it's kind of the way the world feels right now, lost in hope. And he, he basically sings that I'm a lost cause. I have no hope. And it's what the world, that's why we need to take it out of Jesus Christ out into the world. And he was talking about how he really felt better with the smokers and the drinkers and not with anyone else. But what really, really struck me about him was on the back of his vest, it said, better with the lost than the found. Man, that makes me cry. It makes me cry. And, and he's out there in front of thousands of people. Millions of people are buying his records. And I remember him showing pictures out in the crowd. And he was singing that song, Lost Cause. And you could see people singing it at the top of their lungs. And it's sad. But the world out there and that's part of the problem with you and I, ladies and gentlemen, is, is they do. It, the natural man, of course, the natural man feels better with the lost than they do the found. That's all they know. That's normal for them. You see, the problem is for you and I as Christians, we need to find them a new norm. We need to teach them Jesus Christ because they need to be, as many of you do know that are here, sitting out here in this congregation today, that you are much better off with the found than you were the lost. Amen. And you know that you were in the same spot that those people were in. Amen? We need to make sure, ladies and gentlemen, that we are letting the lost know that they can be found and that it is better to be found than lost. You and I need to be able to associate, associate with the humble. Scriptures acknowledge, ladies and gentlemen, that there are those who are, whose situation and gifts are more humble than perhaps what yours are. Jesus said you're always going to have the poor with you. We honor God as we love all men well, especially those who are perceived as lowly. I'm going to turn to the book of James. I'm just going to read it to you. We're running short on time. So if you would, just listen, because James addresses this factor, how we, how we are to do this. This is James chapter 2. It says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and fine apparel, and there should also come a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or you sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has, not, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are, conv are convicted by the law as transgressors. Jesus in Luke chapter 14, it's actually, I'm not going to turn there, it was verses 7 through, 7 through 14, I believe. If you remember, Jesus told us that we should invite the lowly. Don't invite the ones that can come and will repay you or can repay you. 
Invite into your home those that can't repay. Why would Jesus say that? I can tell you exactly why Jesus said that. Because that's exactly what Jesus did for you. Amen? Amen? You had a sin debt that you could not pay. And He paid it for you. He humbled Himself, humbled himself to death on a cross. And the last part that we're going to come to before we get to our conclusion says, do not be wise in your own opinion. I think we all know what that means, don't we? Our temptation is to think too much of our own wisdom. This sin will lead us to haughtiness, and it truly makes it harder to empathize with others. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever said to yourself, if I was in charge, this is how I would do it? Here's your sign. You may be a little haughty. Because you think you know better, even though you may not have all the information. You see, God has all the information. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So ladies and gentlemen, beloved, as we live in ways that are contrary to the ways of the world, and that's how we're supposed to live, you see, God can use our obedience to show the power of the gospel and to show His own glory in that world. There's nothing God loves more than for the world out there to see you, you, those of you that have come to Jesus Christ, to see a difference in your life and to give the glory to Him. And that's what we're supposed to do. You know, the chief end of man, ladies and gentlemen, it says in Ecclesiastes, is to what? Give God glory. That's what we are to do. We are to give Him all praise and all glory. Let us pray. Dear Gracious and Heavenly Father, we come to You today, Lord. Lord, we do just ask that we be a peculiar people. Not peculiar in an odd way, but peculiar in the, in the way that we treat and we, uh, we interact with others. That we might be in Your Spirit all the time. That we may act like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That we would bless and not curse. That we would show empathy and rejoice. And Lord, that we would show a lost and dying world that's out there that it's better to be with the found than it is with the lost. Lord, we just ask now as we have our time of invitation, if there's anyone that doesn't know Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they might be convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit, understand that their sin separates them from God, and that Jesus Christ died for that sin, that He was buried and that He rose again, that that sin and death have no power over Him, and that they too can have eternal life. Lord, for those of us that may have been backslidden, maybe we need to bring something to you. Now's the time. Lord, we just ask that you would have your will and your way, for it is, you know, the beginning and the end of a matter. And we just thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
what another beautiful day. It started out great and it's ending great too. And it ain't over. We still got service tonight, so come on back. <laughs> but anyway, Cameron comes to us today and he has accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He's repented of his sins and know that he needs Jesus and wants to be baptized. So upon his profession of <laughs> on his profession of faith, all those in favor of allowing him into our church, say amen. amen. Anybody any opposed? All right. Well, we'll get him baptized here soon. I guess we could go up there and do it now, huh? <laughs> we'll wait. But anyway, because I'm sure there's some family that want to come. But at any rate, he uh, comes to us. What a wonderful thing it is. We'll sing one more stanza and then we'll get out of here. Come on up and uh, congratulate Cameron then on your way out, okay? Amen. Back to verse one. Oh, did we get. <laughs> oh, sweet. 